I was down with the no way up and I needed some help. Everybody breathing but not living, just existing. Well, and I needed some help. Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free. that you joined us today. To all our virtual worshipers, to our family, to all our friends, we want you to get up out of your seat and praise the Lord with us. Come with me and let's go to the throne of grace. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank and praise you for this day. For this is the day you have made and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. I ask you, Father, anoint our musicians, anoint our choir, dear Heavenly Father, and most of all, anoint your word that it might sink deep within the hearts of the people watching. In Jesus Christ, our Redeemer's sake, I ask you to anoint our pastor, to bring back to remembrance everything he studied. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you. Now, now, join us as our praise team ushers us in to the throne room. God bless you. Praise the Lord.
welcome to Resurrection Sunday. It's Easter. Think about it. The Lord got up. He had all power in his hands. And again, we have a chance to worship. Boy, there's been a lot going on this year trying to tear down the saints, tear down the word of God. Here we stand on Resurrection Sunday. I know you're as excited as I am because the world is showing us how real our Savior is. So during this pandemic, whatever the struggle is you're going through, remember, God did not bring us this far to leave us now. Throw me a quick word of prayer as we think about the years and years of worship and service and all those Easter's when you were standing in a church somewhere. Bring back the power of God. That's right. Lord God, we are excited. We are ecstatic. We are overjoyed that you have allowed us to stand through another Resurrection Sunday to feel the Holy Spirit moving in our house, in our kitchen, in our living room, wherever we are listening, God. Because your power has saved us. Somebody needs this word this morning. We need a word from you, Lord. So I ask you to bless this word in Jesus' name. Amen. Grab your Bibles and go to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28. Of course, it's Easter Sunday, but we have a word from God that we're going to read. And hopefully, God's going to breathe on this word. And you're going to get this fresh thought that God has given me. Uh, something that is relevant and timely for where we are now. Uh, Easter. Just saying these things to you is powerful. Matthew chapter 28, you know the verse, you know the story, but let's read it together. I'm only going to read the first 10 verses. After the Sabbath, at the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified, but he is not here. He has risen. Just as he said, come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell the disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the woman hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to the disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him and clasped his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go tell my brothers, my followers, to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Verse 10, then Jesus said, do not be afraid. Go tell my brothers, my followers, to go to Galilee. And there they will see me. I'm going to give you the thought that the Lord has given me something that's going to send you over the top with understanding the power of this day. I'm going to speak from this song for as long as the Holy Spirit will allow. Created for a comeback. Created for a comeback. Everybody loves a good comeback story. A story where the person is at his wits end, uh, at the end of their rope, as it said, they're up against the wall, they, they're overwhelmed, they're at a place where it looks like they can no longer function. You know what I'm talking about, a place where it seems that they are filled with, their life is, has nothing but disaster. And you're looking and saying, there's no way out. Uh, I'm talking about personal illness. 
financial struggles. Maybe you lost a reputation, a relationship, children's struggles, a lack of finance, a lack of resources. I'm talking about when your life has fallen apart, racial discrimination. You're in a hole. I don't know what it is, but it looks like it's over. Many of us have been there. But then, here, here's what a comeback story says. Seemingly out of nowhere, this person not only gets back on top and wins, but miraculously, they seem to be stronger and better off than they were. We love this underdog story. You know why we love it? Because all of us know that sometimes in our life, if it hasn't happened yet, it will happen that we all fall into that place where we're gonna have to face some tough situations. Maybe somebody's there this morning, some strong situations, maybe somebody's there, or you've been there a month, or two months, or three months, I don't know, but all of us are gonna have to face that. So we know that we hope that we can have that miraculous comeback. We all know the story or have heard uh, some older people tell you what to expect. They give you these three words, right? Uh, uh, you know these three words even before I say them. But before I say them, let me illustrate them and then you'll fall right into place. Uh, I can remember a time when my grandmother used to can her fruits and vegetables. I know I just lost uh, a whole lot of folk because you, you, you got to be at least over 50 to understand where I'm coming from now. But canning was something they used to do. And at my grandmom's house, I was there, and she said, I need you to go down the basement where she kept her fruits and vegetables that were canned, and I need you to get this for dinner. So I went, start walking down the basement. Before I could get halfway down the steps, my grandmom said, Alan, get back up here. And I hurried and grabbed what she told me. I ran back up in the kitchen, and grandmom said, boy, I tried to stop you before you got that stuff. I said, why? Well, she said, I had already got it. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I looked on the counter and I said, Grandma. She said, boy, here go the words. Just keep living. Yeah, you heard it, right? Just keep living. You know what? I did not understand it when she said it then, but I understand it now. We all know just keep living means we gonna run into a time. And we're going to find ourselves in a situation where we have to fight our way through. All I'm saying is we all are going to have to learn to endure. So I'm going to tell you the secret of a divine comeback. Uh, James 1 and 12 says this. Uh, we're all going to need to fight for our blessings. James says that uh, blessed is the man who endures temptation when he is tried. For the Lord shall give him the crown of life as he has promised to all of those who love him. Look what he said. Blessings come when I endure. And when I endure, I get a crown of life. And I have to fight for my blessings. There's a lot of comeback stories, but... Uh, in sports, I could tell some, and you heard of a comeback, and maybe there's one that's your favorite, but there's one that is very appropriate, and that is the story of James J. Braddock, uh, a professional fighter right here from New Jersey. You may have heard about him, but he was so tenacious that he was given many nicknames for his heart and determination. They called him, since he was from New Jersey, they called him the Bulldog of Bergen. They called him the Pride of the Irish. They called him the Pride of New Jersey. And finally, they called him Cinderella Man. Uh-huh. You've heard the story. You may have seen it. Cinderella Man was a movie with Russell Stowe and uh, 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 Renee Zellweger played the the key roles and in this story he told the life of J. John Brown. Great story. Comeback story. He was called Cinderella Man because of his unlikely comeback. What happened? He was a great fighter. Was on top for years. But he, but he gave way to all of these chronic illnesses. He kept breaking his hand. He broke his ribs. Everything was happening to him. And then the boxing commission said, look, if you can't continue to fight, you're going to have to take your license. And finally, he couldn't beat nobody. He was done. They took his license. And then real trouble came. The depression hit. 
When the Great Depression came, him and his wife and his three kids, he had three children, they lost everything. They lost their big home. They were living in this shack and they could barely afford to pay for food. But while he was there at this lowest moment, he made up in his mind that now is he found something in him. There's something about being low. There's something about struggling that said, I am going to be a good provider and a good father and a good husband, even though we're in this terrible tragedy. So he found himself, he had to go to the docks, and since he had a broke left hand, he had to palletize and learn how to use his one hand, and he palletized and loaded boats, and then after that, that work disappeared. Then he had to go down to the public assistance office and then sign up to get a handout. Then that wasn't enough to pay his bills. Then when the heat got cut off, and one of the children got sick, and his wife, while he was out looking for work, took the kids and gave them to her sister and sprayed them all over the, with the rest of the relatives. He was hurt. He was angry when he got back to the house. But he made up his mind. He's going to do whatever it takes to take care of his family. And he found himself at the boxing club where he once went to socialize. He walked in the door. Can you see him? Took his hat off and walked over to these same people and began to beg for money. He said, I need $18 to get the heat back on and to get my kids. I need $18. And all of a sudden, some laughed at him. Some, some sneered and turned away. Others helped him out. He wasn't too proud to beg to help his family. He had reached that point where he had to do whatever it takes. People knew he was done. They knew he was finished. But then as God would have it, he got back and got another fight. When he got the other fight, he was a different man. He started winning. As a matter of fact, because he had to learn how to use his other hand, he was a better boxer, he had better skills. He won every fight. And then he got a chance to fight for the heavyweight championship. He was knocking out every contender. And he had a chance to fight, and he beat Max Bear for the heavyweight title. How do you go from broke, begging, living in a shack, to winning the heavyweight championship when everybody thought he was done. Everybody thought it was over. Sometimes he did, but he made a comeback. That's what Easter is about. That's what the resurrection is about. That's what the death burial of Jesus Christ is about. It's about Jesus getting up after dying on the cross. His finished work on the cross gave us the ability to come back from any situation. I'm telling you this morning that you are created for a comeback. When Jesus got up, he gave you the ability to come back from any situation, any sickness, anything that happens in your life. You have the ability to come back because of what Jesus did on that cross. Somebody better hear me. The reason we can come back is because of the power that God has placed in the finished work of redemption. You don't believe me? When I read this text, Matthew 28, you know it's, it, 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 it's very familiar to you because therein lies the Great Commission. Verses 18 through 20, right? In the Great Commission, he said, Jesus came and spake to them and said, I, all power has been given to me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And whatsoever I have taught you, teach them to observe. And lo, I am with you always. Did you hear that? Don't miss it. We read that permission too fast. Here's what Jesus said. I have the power. I want it on the cross. Come on, don't miss this. And the power that I want on the cross. Because in the text, he never says, I, he never says, I'm giving you the power. He just says, go ye therefore. He's telling you, you have the power and the ability to go. He says, go ye therefore with the, with the power that I just won on the cross. I give you that same power so you can win. Did you see it? There is nothing you can't come back from. There is nothing that can tie you down for. The resurrection is about God understanding that we needed to have the ability to come back. You were created 
for a comment, but that's not even the revelation that the Holy Ghost revealed to me. You're going to love this. Our text verse, I told you verse 10 of our text is where I was signing at because something strange happened when I read this part of the text. You know how you read something and you read it time and time again, but then the Holy Spirit will implant a thought in you, a freeing thought that shows you something. God showed me something. Don't miss this. Look what he said. In that verse it says, do not be afraid. But go tell my followers to go to Galilee, and I will see them there. Somebody said, Pastor, I don't understand. What they got to do to come back? Follow it. He said, do not be afraid. He's talking to Mary, Mary Magdalene, and Mary that was at the cross. He said, go be afraid. Go tell my followers to go to Galilee, and I'll see them there. Wait a minute. This was, I was confused. Go tell your who? Your followers. Jesus. Last time I checked, you had no followers. When you got arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, all your boys left. When you got taken from judgment hall to judgment hall, wasn't nobody behind you. Why are you saying, go tell your followers? Last time I checked, the only person faithful enough to even be at the cross was the Apostle John, and he was there with your mother and his mother. Peter was the one who said, I'll never run away. He not only ran away, he cursed and ran away. So what Followers, are you talking about? Did he hit me? Oh, he said, no, no, you don't understand. Go tell them, I know they fell. I know they're at the bottom. I know they hit rock bottom. I know they ran away. But now that I've gotten up, now that I've been resurrected, I now have created through the plan of redemption believers who can make a comeback, not on their power, but on my power. He was saying, go tell my followers. What's following? So you messed up. So what? So you didn't do right. So what? So things are bad. God said, I now will tell you this morning. I'm telling you. You have a divine right to make a comeback. Dream again. Shout again. Believe again. You have the power for a comeback. Look at this text. It is so powerful. You know the Easter story, but now look at it through the eyes of you. Never, ever let the enemy steal your life or control your life when you have the power to overcome what the enemy was trying to do. Everything in the word of God, when you look at it, is telling us we can make a comeback. Somebody said, how? I'm glad you asked. First of all, listen to Isaiah in Isaiah 40 and 31. Look what he said. They that wait on the Lord. Can you help me? Shout! They that wait on the Lord. Shall! Not maybe. Shall renew their strength. They shall not have the wings of the eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Did you hear what God said? When you wait on me. I don't know what you're waiting on. I don't know how long you're waiting. But I'm telling you something this morning. If you wait long enough, you will make a comeback. You shall get up and have the strength you need. Not only that, Proverbs 24, 16 tells us, a righteous man. See, some of y'all worried about your baggage, how far you fell and what you've done. God said, I don't even care. A righteous man can fall seven times and get back up again. But a wicked can fall once and be overwhelmed. Look what God is saying. He said, because you're righteous, even though you fell. Hallelujah, somebody. Somebody hear me today. Folk count you out. People said you were done. You're never done. People said you were out. It's never out. People said you were old. You're never old. People said you did too much. You never done too much. People said you lost too much. You never lost too much. People said you'll never come back. They lied. Did somebody hear me? You will make a comeback because God said, He's going to bless you to get back up again. And finally, 1 Peter 5 and 10. Now unto God who has called us into grace through Jesus Christ for his glory. I love this text. After you suffer a while, 1 Peter 5 and 10, he will make you perfect, establish you, strengthen you, and settle you. Did you see that? Look at the process of coming back. He said, after you suffer. I'm telling somebody this morning, I don't care if you're going through suffering. It won't last because God said, after you suffer for a little while, he said, I will make you perfect. The word perfect means mature. I will strengthen you. I will reestablish you. And I will settle you. You're going to get settled 
again. This is a powerful text. You better find me while I, uh, uh, you know, architect it for you. Let me design it for you. Let me show you how we can find out how to make a comeback by what happened on Easter Sunday morning. You know the story. But here are the three points I need you to pull out of this text. First, you got to make sure that in your own heart and mind, you keep serving and trusting God. This is the biggest thing I'm asking, no matter how bad it gets. Mm, put that in the chat you, if, you, if you identify with that. i got to keep serving and trusting God. Some of y'all quit. Don't stop. Then you gotta figure out, I must keep relying on his ability to remove obstacles. Keep serving and trusting, keep relying on his ability to remove obstacles. And finally, keep following where Jesus leads. This is good. Text says on the first day after the Sabbath, first day of the week in Matthew's gospel, said at dawn, that means it was still dark out. Mary, Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, came to the tomb. And it tells us in Mark's Gospel, chapter 16, a little more information, says it was Mary, Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome. Salome was the mother, was the wife of Zebedee and the mother of the apostles, John and James. She was there, and Mark's Gospel also tells us that they had spices to finish preparing the body of Jesus. I need you to see something here. I need you to see these ladies as they were going to the tomb the, after the Sabbath. Now, Jewish Sabbath was from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. And our Sabbath is on Sunday. But Sunday was called the first of the week. That's why the text says first of the week. So the first of the week, which was a Sunday, relies us and let us, know, let us know the gospel is true when they say he was crucified on Friday, stayed in the grave all day Saturday. But early Sunday morning, he got up. That's where they went. And they went to the tomb. So the first thing we need to point out, that these women were still committed to serving God. You got to keep trusting and serving. Oh, I'm talking to somebody right now. You got it. I know it's bad. I know you cry, but through your tears, through your pain, through your struggle, get up and tell yourself, nothing will stop me from serving God. Do you see these women? They were serving and trusting. Now, that I, I don't know, they bought spices to to you know to finish preparing the body of Jesus. You know the body had already been prepared based on Jewish custom. But what they brought the spices for when the body started to decompose, it had a stitch to it. So they were going to use the spices to cover the odor of this of this Savior's body. But when they got there, there was no body. But here's what I want you to see. They went anyhow. No disciples were there, but these three ladies went to the tomb. And they went because they were bound by duty to serve. Do you have a duty to God, or are you doing it for somebody else? Do you know why you can't make a comeback? Because you don't have that spirit to continue trusting and serving God in the midst of a struggle. Watch this. These women went, and Jesus has said many times, he told his disciples, and these women followed that he was going to die and on the third day be resurrected and born again? Do you realize that when Jesus, so I don't know if Mary, Magdalene, and Mary, and all of them, I don't know what they were thinking about, but Jesus' mother surely know. I bet they walked there after seeing all those miracles and said, he might even be risen. See, when you have the ability to make a comeback, you gotta keep trusting and serving no matter what. Uh, uh, one of the first things I learned from a mentor in seminary was here was a thought he gave us as we were studying the Old Testament. He said, work as if everything depends on you, but pray as if everything depends on God. That's what these women were doing. They were going because they realized it's only through service. You can't get a miracle if you stop serving. You, you remember the man at the pool of Bethesda? You remember the fact that he had been sitting there over 40 years, all those years sitting there with a miracle right in front of him, and he wouldn't move. And when Jesus came to him, Jesus had to wake him up and let him know, you can't get a blessing just sitting around here. Look at the words Jesus asked him. Do you want to be saved? The man said, yes. 
he said. And what Jesus told him, he looked at him and said, okay, take up your bed and walk. Did you hear? Here's the problem. Some of you sit back and miss your blessings waiting on God to show up. You better get up and keep serving him. You better get up and keep doing something. You better get up and keep praying. You better get up and keep believing. Don't hang your head down. You can't get a blessing while you're whining. Man, if you need money to pay your bills or you know your job don't make enough money, you don't quit your job. You keep on working and you pray that God will pay the bills. Been there. Done that. You know that if you're sick and you're in the hospital and it's desperate and the doctor tells you it's all over, you don't give up. You go and take your medication. You keep on trusting, but you pray. And then out of nowhere, here comes the comeback. God pays the bills. Out of nowhere. I know I got a witness out there. Can you witness with me? God makes sure the body is healed. All I'm saying is you got to know I got to keep serving. I'm giving somebody some dying information this morning. Maybe... Some things would have happened in your life already if you would have continued serving God because that's what God expects us to do. It's only through service that we can get blessed. Miracles happen when we serve. Remember Daniel was thrown into a lion's den. Come on, talk about somebody that looked like they're up against it. Uh, how how in the world could not the hungry lions eat him? But Daniel had faith in God. Here's why he was thrown in. Because he would not stop honoring God. Go ahead, Daniel. That's why. You want to be like Daniel? No, you don't. You want to be like Daniel? You want to say, he went in the lion's den because he said, I refuse to stop serving God. And when he got into the lion's den, not only did the lions not harm him, when he came out, somebody come back, he was not he was unharmed, but he got promoted higher than he was before he went in. A divine comeback that's waiting on you comes through service. It comes when you understand that I got to keep serving God no matter how bad it looks. And that's when the miracle happened. The miracle comes through service. Can I give you one more Gideon? If you go to the Old Testament, when Joshua was conquering the land, the, the tribe of Gibeon, the, 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 Gibeon, the Gibeonites actually joined the Israelites. Uh, go to Joshua chapter 10. You're going to find out that in Joshua chapter 10, we have the story where uh, the five kings of the Amorites got together when they heard that the Israelites had conquered Ai and Jericho and were coming after them. But then they heard that Gibeon had actually made a pact of peace with them. Follow the story. And Gibeon was smart enough to know, I'm going to serve the God of the Israelites. He seems to be the right God. And then all of a sudden, the five kings got together and attacked Gibeon. Check it out. This is a powerful miracle. You may not have heard this one before. And when they got there, uh, the Gibeonites cried out, sent a messenger to Joshua, come and help us. Have your God come save us. Joshua went, but before he went, he prayed, and God said, I'm giving the Gibeonites into your hand. Watch the story. And Joshua, in the middle of the battle, when they arrived, it was getting dark. Do you know what my God did? Because they decided to serve him. Joshua stepped up right in the middle of the camp so that the Gibeonites, everybody could see him. And he looked up in the sky. He said, oh, God, make the sun stand still and make the moon stay where it's at in the valley of Ajalon. Did you hear what Joshua did? Joshua said, God, I need the sun to stand still. God answered, make the sun stand still. It didn't go down all day so that they could continue defeating their enemies. Wow. But an awesome God we serve. He said, I'm going to let you know. And the text says, you go to Joshua 10 and check this out. He said that there's never been a day like it since. There was never a day before. But understand, ooh, God listened to a man. Oh, come here. In your house. Knelt down by your bed. Come on, get that distraction out of your mind. God is hearing every word you said. He's bringing miracles for it because he listens when you serve and they were serving God and the beauty of their service to God the Gibeonites saw I know they were ecstatic we picked the right God when they saw that miracle 
God said, as you serve, keep trusting and serving, no matter how bad it looks, I'm going to create a miracle. And the greatest miracle was when Jesus himself, in the 10th chapter, or 20th chapter of this text, when Jesus himself said, you know, that uh, that same Salome I was telling you about, the mother of James and John, son of Zebedee, came to him and asked him, you know, give his sons the high seat. And he said, wait a minute, the greatest of you shall be the servant. That's why we sometimes can't get blessed. We don't want to serve nobody. We all think it's about what we can get instead of service. And then Jesus said, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. Did you understand what Jesus was saying? He said, how I do all these miracles is because I've given my heart to my Father and I serve him. And you can do the same thing if you will serve. And they held these women. See them there. They held to their convictions. They went there and trust God out of gratitude. I love this. Gratitude is not thanking God for what he will do. It's not being glad even for what he's doing right now. Gratitude is being glad and being grateful for what the Lord has done. Grateful people know I never ever sit back and don't worship God and get myself all messed up because I realize I have received so many undeserved breaks, so many undeserved passes. Can I get away with this? So much God has given me. Other folk have gone down and I'm still standing. Other folk went crazy and I'm still here. You know you had enough to go crazy about just like somebody else. Can you shout where you are and say it must have been the favor of the Lord? Because gratitude says, Lord, you've been too good. Disciples read, I remember when we went to the cross. What they said, you've been too good for us to back up now. And they stood there being grateful. I will tell you this. It's been scientifically proven that gratitude. People who are grateful are healthier, live longer, are stronger, and have a better outlook on life. I don't have time for you to count your blessings, but I wish you'd get out that phone. And just be grateful this morning. There's some things you got to think in your mind and bring up to say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for that. Thank you, I didn't go under it. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done. I got to quit. I got to quit. I'm getting get too happy. You need to understand something. These women had gratitude. Point two, keep relying on God to move the obstacles. That's a big one. Many of us don't move because we're scared. Because we see the obstacles. And God is saying, trust me to move the obstacles. Verse 2 said, there was a great earthquake. And behold, an angel descended from heaven. And the stone was rolled away. I need you to see that. The stone was rolled away. These women were standing there at the tomb. Trusting that God would move the stone. Think about it. Have you ever thought about it? How did they think they were going to move that stone to get to Jesus' body? They had faith to believe, just like God moved, oh, this is a shot point right here, moved the last obstacle. My God can move this obstacle if I trust him. Thank you, Jesus. Just like he did the last time. If somebody shout for it, get there, because the same God that I trusted to move the last obstacle can remove the obstacle this time. They trusted God to do so. Matter of fact, Master Cato said, why did uh, the eight, God didn't have to move the stone so Jesus could get out. Jesus could have walked through the wall. He didn't have to move the stone so the angels could get in. No, the angels could have gotten in any kind of way. But he said, he moved the stone, watch this, because he saw the women coming. Oh, he moved the stone out the way. He had a plan to move the stone, but you got to have enough faith to believe you're going to move the stone. God got a plan to move your obstacle. You can make a comeback if you got enough faith to believe you're going to move your obstacle. Oh, yeah, there's some Holy Ghost in this statement right here. God got a plan to move your obstacle. You just got to have enough faith to walk up to your obstacle and let God move your obstacle. You got to trust. That God is going to do it. Where were the disciples? The ones who walked with him and talked with him. I'm talking to you. And 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 then aside. I wasn't gonna say this, but God just prepped this in my heart. Women, do you know that the church would be in trouble 
if it wasn't for women. If women had not been a part of our church, somebody say amen, lights and walls, churches would have fallen apart because the women have always been strong and had a heart for God. We up there arguing about whether they can preach or not. You better let the women loose and let their anointing in the church. That's why it's in there now. I'm sorry, some of them don't like that. But we're holding back the power of God coming in our lives. And these women standing here when nobody else was. And they, watch this. Uh, it was when I was at New Hope Baptist Church. It wasn't the men who taught me how to shout and trust God. It was, it was the women. Man, I remember somebody out there looking at me. You used to go to church with me. Understand this. Sister Hattie Mae Johnson. Come on. She stand up in the church and she would look out. And when the rep, when Reverend got real high and the service was really moving, she would say, Talk good, Reverend. Talk good. And I remember they would shout out when they got filled with the Spirit. Women taught that. And if it had not been for women in our church, we'd be jacked up right now. As a matter of fact, we ought to learn from the gospel of James Brown. You know what James Brown said? This is a man's world. The man's world. But it wouldn't be nothing. Nothing! Without a woman or a girl. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. It's a man's world, but it wouldn't be nothing without a woman or a girl. The text tells us it was dark. And it was dark. But the best time to trust God is in your darkness. Can I talk to somebody? How many know? Oh, if you look back over your life, it was the dark moments that gave you the most joy. It was the dark moments that gave you the afterthought that I can do all things through Christ. Uh, during the uh, French Impressionist painting period, there were two friends who were some of the most professional painters around. And as they were going through during their painting, it was a blessing before God because they stuck together. Henry Matisse and August Renoir were great painters. Well, Renoir got sick in his health, and his doctor confined him the last 10 years of his life to confinement to take care of himself. He was suffering from arthritis and pains all over his body. And his friend, Henry would come and visit him. Matisse would always go and visit his friend every day and try to encourage him. And he would watch Renoir, Renoir painting with great pain, his hands full of arthritis. He was in agony, but he would continue to paint. One day watching his friend go through this, and he said, why do you keep painting when you're hurting so? Renoir never took his eyes off the canvas. He kept painting, concentrating totally on that. And then he looked up and said softly, the pain passes, but the beauty remains. That's the testimony of every one of us who are standing through trials now. We know this too shall pass. We know that suffering may endure for a night, but some new joy is coming in the morning. We know that this is just temporary, but we also know the beauty of being able to say, the Lord delivered me. The beauty of those long nights watching God's arms around me. The beauty of waking up in the morning, seeing a fresh sunshine. The beauty of riding down the road saying, I'm still here. The beauty of knowing I got that in my pocket. I can tell anybody, God, has made a way. Oh, you heard it. He made a way. Keep making a way. And so let me close. Let me get to the last point. So we found out the disciples who had seen him do all the miracles, they had watched him, they allowed themselves to get to the point where they could not handle the darkness. If you can't handle the darkness, you will never make a comeback to the light. You must know God has not let you down. He's getting you ready for your comeback. That's what these women knew. That's what the disciples forgot about. They forgot that God moves obstacles 
But you gotta understand his word. There was this pilot who was a new pilot who had just learned how to fly his personal airplane. And he was out flying, he was still a little shaky on letting the tower land him through his instruments. And he got panicky, and the tower came back with a stern voice saying, hey, you just follow the instructions. We'll worry about the obstructions. I like that. He said, God is saying, follow my instructions. Ask, see, and not. Turn to somebody and say, follow my instructions. The instructions say, no weapon formed against me shall rise. The instructions say, if I keep on trusting, I will get through. The instructions say, he will supply. I just can't worry about the obstructions. Let's go to the last one. It tells us not only, as you can see, the angel came. Verse 6 is the key verse to the resurrection. You search for Jesus. He is not here. The greatest obstacle God removed was our sin. What are you talking about? He died for our sin. Now, I know some of you don't claim you had it, but some of us who still have to wrestle with sin, the honest folk, uh, there's some sins we still got to fight every day, right? There's some nastiness, some selfishness, some jealousy, some anger, some under, I don't know, I don't put names in sins because if you don't see God, you will never change. But those of us who got to know, we thank God because God said, I got to remove the last, the greatest opportunity to come back. There was this young boy, I'm on my clothes, who said, whatever reason he would get in trouble. Constantly in trouble at school, constantly misbehaving. His father just was beside himself, saying, um, I've always given him unconditional love. I treated him right. I gave him a good home life. Matter of fact, we go to church. We go to Sunday school. At home, we even read the Bible. This boy's behavior is beyond me, but the boy kept on messing up. But one day, 10 years old, he went upstairs and started playing with the bat and ball in his bedroom. Broke the bedroom window. And he knew trouble was coming. Because he heard his dad coming up the steps. So his dad took his belt off when he walked in the room. The boy voluntarily knelt down across the bed. But his father did something strange. He said, son, take my belt. His son said, huh? And he took his father's belt. And his father took his shirt off kneeled down across the bed. He said, now take the belt and hit me seven times across my back. Give me seven lashes. The boy said, Dad, I can't do that. And he started almost crying. He said, Dad, his dad said, he insisted. Hit me with the belt. So the boy reached out and hit him one time. He said, no, hit me hard. And the boy hit hard. He said, no, I want you to hit me hard. And the boy started hitting his dad hard as he could seven times. And when he got done, Dad looked at the boy and said, do you know why I told you to do that? He said, no, Father. He said, because Jesus Christ was whipped and beaten worse than any man has ever been beaten. He was, his beard was plucked out. He was whipped all night long. He was bruised, and he did it so he could die for those who were not even grateful that he was dying. And then the father asked him one more question. Do you know who did that to Jesus? And the boy threw his tears and said, yeah, the Romans who were in the Jews. He said, no. His father did. His father whipped him. Gave him up. Killed him for you and me so that we now could live for him the best we can and never ever make him hurt again. I will be He learned a lesson. He changed. He wasn't perfect, but he changed. Because here's the key. The biggest obstacle to my comeback was removed because Jesus loved me enough to kill his son for me. You think I'm, I'm going to let the devil stop my comeback? After all God has done, you better come back because Jesus died because he loves you. And then our final verse. After they left the tomb, Jesus met them, and they fell down and began to worship him. 
The last point is to keep following Jesus. Right? Where he leads. You know what happened? Because they kept going, Jesus met them. And the text says they fell down in verse 9. They grabbed his ankles and worshipped him. You want to make a strong comeback? Be a worshiper. Worshiping tears down strongholds. Worshiping makes demons run. Oh, you want to see your house get better? Walk around and worship. You want to see your life get better? Sing in your car. Sing during the day. Worship God. As we worship, we get our breaks. Then he said, tell my followers. That was a text on it. To meet me. And I know what the disciples said. He still wants me. I've been unfaithful. He still wants me. And Jesus said, yeah. Because you're getting ready to make a comeback. And every one of those disciples did some powerful things under the unction of the Holy Spirit. This morning I'm closing, but you need to tell yourself, I'm getting ready to come back. I'm getting ready to dream again. I'm getting ready to shout again. I'm getting ready to make my comeback. Nothing's going to stop me from getting back what the enemy tried to steal. I'm done. But listen. You were created by the finished work of Calvary. You were created for your combat tribe. It's yours. This is Pastor Duncan saying that we need a word. In your life, you need a word that tells you to say, pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord God, I'm a sinner. I know you died. And I need your salvation in my life. And because I say it, I'm saved. If you believe that prayer, you are saved. God bless you this Resurrection Sunday. Go back and make sure you realize I'm created for my comeback. God bless you. Take it to him and leave it there. I was down, but with the no way up, and I needed some help. Everybody Breathing but not living Just existing Well, and I needed some help Somebody told me that Jesus Will set you free